This sermon was preached at Crossway Church in Battleground, Washington. It's part of our series, 1 Corinthians, Viewing Life Through the Gospel Lens. We hope that you're challenged and encouraged by it. When have you seen a kid act defiantly in such a way that you wish there was some discipline? At one of my girls' recent volleyball games, a younger kid, uh, probably first or second grade, was filming his sister's game and uh, he wanted to get the perfect shot. He was so consumed with his phone that he got right up to the edge of both lines and didn't notice that the girl was trying to surf right behind him. And so the referee got off her stand, well, got off, came over and asked the kid to move. He didn't want to move, but he finally took a couple of steps and then she asked him to sit on the stand and he said, no, I don't want to. I want to get a good video. I cringed. I cringed partly because I wanted this kid to understand that if he do doesn't do what the referee says, he could get his team a purple card. And she asked what team he was for, and it was our team. And that we were up 24-20, but if that would give them five points, which would potentially give them the game. But it was more of the attitude, that defiance, that kind of stuck it to me, Right? Here's an adult asking him to sit down, and he was kind of consumed with what he was doing and not paying attention. Now, thankfully, thankfully, um, by the time she went over and talked to the other referee, he sat on the bench and it was dealt with. But it was one of those moments that I just cringed at, you know? Those moments that you, you think, oh, where is this? Why is this happening? Well, today we are going to be dealing with a, a pretty interesting topic. How do you deal with those kind of cringe-worthy situations in the church where you see difficult things happen and you wonder, how do you deal with it? Now, right off the bat, I just want to lay my cards on the table and say that I think there's two ditches of church discipline that we need to avoid. And Paul's actually going to talk about both of them. I think most of the time when we think about church discipline, we think about those that are done in a self-righteous and a harsh way. It's a discipline that's used in a tool to keep people in line. And often it's used over issues that I would say, quite frankly, maybe the Bible doesn't even have, is, has more freedom and flexibility than what we do. But it's a narrow view of things and, and people want to use it to keep power and control. And so they're harsh and self-righteous in the way that they do that. And unfortunately, that's the kind of church discipline that often makes the news. And often it's the kind of church discipline that, quite frankly, has harmed some folks in our own congregation because of the way that it's been done. But there's also another ditch, and that's where you're complacent and do nothing. You have this attitude that everything is considered personal choice and it's private, so we can't judge. Well, the Apostle Paul is going to talk about both of those ditches and tell us that there's a, a, a different path that we can take, one that hopefully is based on love and has a desire for the person's ultimate good in mind, and that's hopefully what we see here today. One of the things that I love about preaching through a book of the Bible is that you have to bring, you don't get to choose the topics you get to deal with. Now, I avoided preaching on 1 Corinthians 5 for Easter and Palm Sunday. Probably not a great text to preach on Resurrection Sunday. Um, but here at Crossway, we preach through a book, and it's important for us just to pick that up and go through it again. And so we're going to find ourselves in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 13. And if you're new here, uh, hang on, it's a ride, I understand that. But hopefully you understand and you see that this is an important topic and the reasons why. And I actually think the Apostle Paul lists those in our text here today. So if you want to join with me uh, in reading your scriptures, we read the NIV here. So if you want to turn with your Bibles and the pews there, it's there. But we will be reading through 1 Corinthians 5 verses 1 through 13. It is actually reported that there is, sexually immor so there is sexual immorality among you and of the kind that even the pagans do not tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife and you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of your fellowship the man who has been doing this? For my part, even though I am not physically present, I am with you in the spirit. As one who is present with you in this way, I have already passed judgment in the name of our Lord Jesus on the one who has been doing this. So when you are assembled and I am with you in spirit and the power of the Lord Jesus is present, hand that, this man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord." 
Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old bread leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy or the swindlers or idolatries. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but a sexually immoral or greedy or an idolater or slanderer or drunkard or swindler. Do not even eat with these people. What business is it of mine to judge those outside of the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked person among you. Now, I understand these words can be harsh, and hopefully we'll unpack them a little bit, and we'll see that there actually is a heart of a pastor of Paul. As we've said throughout this letter, Paul is writing, and we see that he's written to them before, but this is one that made it into the canon of Scripture, to a church that is in a culture that is as wild as it can get. I mean, if there was ever a culture that was crazy and let anything go and it's, it's do whatever you want's right for you, it's the Corinthians. As we said, it was a wealthy town that was between two ports. And so it, it, was, a, it was made of all kinds of people and uh, different kinds of people from different backgrounds. It was one of the churches that had a great influence of people who came outside of the Jewish faith. And so they knew life of this outside world. This is what their life was. And now they came into the church. And Paul, throughout this letter, is helping them wrestle with how do we know what is okay and not okay? And how do we look at life through a gospel lens? And today, what he wants us to see is how do we deal with people who are having a defiant and unrepentant sin? I say that what he's giving us here is a case study of that. Now, I'm using my words very carefully here. Defiant and unrepentant sin. Because oftentimes we can struggle with sins, and we wrestle with them for a lifetime, some of us. And, and it, it, it is that. And as we grow, we go through these ups and these downs. This is not what Paul is talking about. What Paul is talking about in this situation is someone who is claiming that what they're doing isn't wrong at all, and you need to leave me alone and let me just do what I want to do. So there's, there is, is the attitude that he's attacking. Now the case study, it, we know this is a case study because Paul links his advice to other sins, okay? So he's not just saying, hey, this is how you have to deal with this one situation, but he brings up all these other situations and says, hey, if people are stuck, in an unrepentant and defiant sin, then you need to speak in a similar way in their, their life. He lists other things. He uses just a, a blanket term for sexual immorality. Notice he also says the greediness or an idolater or slander or a drunkard or a swindler. It's interesting that I actually heard a story today from somebody outside of the church completely who said they, locked, they left their church because their family members were greedy and went after their loved one's belongings and the hypocrisy of it drove them nuts because they sat in the pew one day and, they, and, and praised Jesus, but they were nasty and greedy behind it. And so we need to see that it's not just this situation, but Paul wants us to see this is how we deal with that undefiant uh, attitude and an unrepentant attitude. And so here's what he says. One, we know that he's given a report. He says it right off the bat. It's actually reported. We've heard that, that Chloe's people have come and talked to him and shared what's going on. That's why he's writing this letter and dealing with the different topics. He's talked about all the boasting that happened where people put their faith in different leaders instead of Jesus in earlier parts of the book. And now he wants to deal with this. How do we deal with defiant and unrepentant sin? And the example that he gives is a man sleeping with his father's wife. Now, it's, he doesn't technically specify whether it's his mother or stepmother. I personally believe it's his stepmother because he uses the term his father's wife. And it would be culturally kind of, it would be the thing that you would expect. Why do I say that? Because usually we have, we, we forget, we live for a long time. Right? I mean, we can have great grandchildren that you get to pray for. 
Um, but in Jesus' day, in Paul's day, th- that life expectancy wasn't it. And so oftentimes, a man would lose his spouse, and what would he do? He would marry a younger woman because she would take care of him and, and, and that. And so it's quite possibly that he could have married somebody the age of his kids. And so in this situation, it seems that a man is sleeping with his father's wife, probably his stepmom. Now, we don't know if the father's alive. We don't know any of those details. It doesn't matter. We don't need to, you know, have all the gossip. But Paul says is that this man was defiant and unrepentant. As a matter of fact, he says that he was bragging about this in church. He, he wasn't like sheepish about his actions. Rather, it seems that his attitude was like, hey, I can do this and it's okay. Now, we don't know what reasons he's given us for why he thinks it's okay, I think Paul is vague because it doesn't matter. It, and we could get so caught up in, in the minutia of all this that it's like, well, I argue it different. No, what Paul is saying is, is that this man is doing something that clearly goes against the sexual standards and ideas of marriage that Paul has or that, Christ, that God has for the church and that he's bragging about it. And he says that, that he, he kind of shames the Corinthians. He says, look, this is so bad that the hypersexual, anything goes Corinthian culture, is even looking down on this. Like, even they know that this isn't probably the right thing for you to do. And if there's ever a culture where anything goes, it is the Corinthians culture. They had everything that we have today in our world today, that was at work in the Corinthian culture right there. I mean, as I said, it was like the Las Vegas of its heyday and the San Francisco in the middle of the gold rush. It's like everything goes and it doesn't matter. Have your wealth, do whatever you want. That was the, the culture of its day. And Paul says, you in the church are bragging about this and you're unrepentant about it. And even the culture around you says, whoa, this isn't the way that it needs to be done. And I want you to see that Paul chides the Corinthian church for doing nothing about this situation. He says, you can't be in this ditch where you do nothing about it. He says, this isn't the way to deal with these kind of situations where somebody is openly, defiantly, and unrepentantly doing something that clearly goes against God's word. He urges them to call out that sinful behavior in other believers. We see this. Now, the question that I get in this is people will ask, but doesn't this go against Jesus's command in Matthew 17, 7, not to judge? If there's one verse I often hear from people that they know, it's this one. Do not judge or you too will be judged. That's Matthew 7. Now, I have a whole sermon on this. It was a text that I heard enough, and actually I wanted to wrestle with myself in seminary that I, in my class, had to write one in my gospel class, and so I wrote it. A sermon on it, and you can listen to a version of it that I, I, I preached on our own website. I don't have time to look into all this. We'd be here all day. But I think what I want you to see is that that's not exactly... The idea here, when people usually use that, is that you can't ever point out sin in other people. But Jesus is very specific in the way that he talks about it. And what he says is, you, have to, you cannot assume that you know the state of one soul and eternally condemn them. When he says, don't judge somebody or you too will be judged, what he's saying is don't condemn them and think that there's no hope for salvation for them because here's the deal. You never know how God is going to work in their own life. And the truth of the gospel is, is that no one is far enough away from God's love. And so don't ever make those kind of eternal condemnations on them to where you think they're too far away from God's love. But he also speaks against the self-righteous criticism when dealing with others' attitudes. He says, if, <laughs> look at the speck of saw, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Now the image is literally like your sin and your junk is keeping you from seeing it. And in that sermon, I tell a sermon illustration about how I watched a movie in Lamar's, Iowa. And that, this is before, you know, all the multiplex. I had to drive 45 minutes to go to a theater. And we went to, I think, I forget which one it was, but it, we, we decided the last minute to go, and we went there, and we got the last seat. What you need to know about the Lamar's Iowa Theater is, like, it was 70s decor in the 90s and had the old that, and it had a pillar right in the middle. 
Guess who got the seat right behind it because it's the last seat available? Me. It's pretty hard to see a movie around a pole. And what Jesus says is, if you're trying to see the sin in somebody else's life and you're not owning your own stuff, you can't have, that's not the way to deal with it. He says, instead, deal with your own self first. And what that does is that makes you humble. And it also makes you realize that you're on an even ground with people. And so you won't be self-righteous and harsh, but rather you'll be gentle and you'll still correct, but you'll do it in a loving way. You notice he says it right there. First take the plank out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck out of your brother's eye. So even in that text, he says we need to be iron sharpened iron. We, we need to have that kind of an influence on people, but we need to do it in the right way. So no, I don't think what Paul says goes against it. And we see that Paul says something similar when he cautions the Corinthians to judge those inside of the church, not outside. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, I think sometimes we can kind of have that self-righteous attitude towards people who don't have faith in Christ about their actions. And we need to remind ourselves, how do we expect people to live in a biblical way when they don't know the biblical truth? And there has to be a spirit of graciousness in that. It doesn't mean that we, we cave to it, but rather what we need to say is, there's a reason why they act that way. It's because they don't know the truth. And so we treat those outside and inside differently. And, and we're going to also see even the way that he deals with this and the language that he uses, even those languages harsh in this text, is the goal is not to beat somebody down or make them feel small, but rather to help them see themselves clearly so that they hopefully put their hope and trust in Jesus. That's the goal of church discipline. So the question is, what does church discipline look like? Now, if there's an image I want you to have of church discipline, it's this image. Well, what's the image? It's a rock that lands in the water and it creates these concentric circles that go out, right? And the goal of church discipline, the job of all of us, is that we keep this circle as tight as possible, okay? And Jesus lays this out really clearly in Matthew 18, so if you want to turn, you can do Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17, where he lays out important steps that individuals must take before it gets to this level. If we're aware of people's sins in their lives, it doesn't start by going and gossip to the pastor or the elders or everybody else about it. Oh, do you see that person? They're so terrible. No. It starts with a private conversation. Keep it as tight as possible and say to them, hey, I'm seeing this in your life playing out. I, I love you and I care about you. And look, I have my own faults, but I think this is something you need to deal with. And you start in a private conversation. Jesus says, hey, if they accept that rebuke, for lack of a better word, if they take that correction, you've won them over because they've moved in the direction of faithfulness to God. If they, and you celebrate it. And you work with them and you, you shine Jesus' grace and love all over them and remind them of God's grace is sufficient for their sins. But let's call their behavior a sin and not just put up with it. If they don't, then there's a next step. If they refuse to repent or admit it, bring it to a few people to help clarify things. Well, why does Jesus do that? Hey, sometimes you and I can read things wrong. And sometimes bringing in another person is another set of eyes. But two, also when you have more than one person sit down with you, it kind of says this is a more important thing. And so the second step is that you bring a few people to clarify. He says, if they will not listen, take one or two others. So that, that circle, what does it get? It gets one step bigger. If they still refuse to repent, then what do you do? Well, then you bring it to the church leadership to admonish. And that's where Paul's saying the step of where we're at. Now, the goal of bringing it to church leadership is, I hope that if somebody would say, if a pastor or an elder or somebody in the church would say to them, hey, this is something that I know you're wrestling with, but we got to call it what it is. You can't be bragging about it and be defiant and say that this is okay when in fact it actually isn't okay. And, and, and we care about you enough that we're going to speak the truth to you, not in a harsh, not in a self-righteous way where we think we're better than you, 
but rather in a way that says, look, we're all works in progress and we all have these things that we wrestle with, but, but this is one where I think you got some blinders on and, and you need to wrestle with this. You, you need to wrestle with this. And then if they still refuse to repent, Jesus says, the church must treat them like an outsider. He says, if they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen to the church, then treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Now here's an important thing I want you to see because we're going to deal with this a little bit more in Paul's way of how, what this means. We'll flush it out here in a little bit. Who does Jesus hang out with? Jesus hangs out with the pagans and tax collectors. I mean, literally in three gospels, the Pharisees come to him and he goes to his disciples and say, why does Jesus keep on hanging out with these tax collectors and pagans? Doesn't he know that he has to hang out with the righteous people and not these people who are all messed up? So when Jesus says that you treat them like a pagan and a tax collector, it doesn't mean that you cut them off and you have no relationship with them, but you do call a spade a spade. That you say, hey, I think there's things in your life that maybe this faith that you profess might be as active as what you think. And so I'm going to preach the gospel to you. I'm going to remind you of Christ's salvation and grace, and you engage with them in a different way doesn't mean that you cut them off. It doesn't mean that you come self-righteous, I'm better than you. But it says that you, you still engage with them and that you have a conversation with them. You just treat the, the, the conversation differently. Does that make sense? So you just admit, I don't think that they're a believer. I'm going to treat them like an unbeliever in my conversations with them. Now, I want you to see that Paul echoes Jesus' teaching in this text. One, he urges us to point out sin for folks who claim to be Christians but are defiantly unrepentant. Can I say that phrase enough, the sermon? Defiantly unrepentant. Now, why do I say that? Because I don't want you to hear that because you struggle with the sin that you know is a sin and you struggle with it for a long time, that that's what we're talking about here. We're not talking about people who say, I struggle with this and I'm wrestling with this and I'm trying to fight it, but it's an uphill battle. We're gracious to people because they recognize the sin in their life and they're trying to do something about it. There's all kinds of things. Listen, we don't just get rid of anger overnight. We don't just get rid of addictions and all these things overnight. It's a process. And so I want you to hear, it's not that you work on sin and you constantly struggle with it. What we're talking about is defiantly unrepentant. It's saying, no, I'm not messed up. What I'm doing is actually okay and I'm gonna brag about it. Paul's saying, in this case, this man is bragging about sleeping with the stepmom and saying, it's the way that it is. It's, it's because Jesus died for me. I can do whatever I want. Well, Paul's going to deal with that later, too. Just because you can do something doesn't mean it's the right thing. But what we see here is that he says it's okay for you to claim it. He says, look, I'm not with you. I've heard all the reports, and I'm already passing judgment. We've already dealt what that means. What he's saying is he's going to call a sin a sin and not just go along with it. And what he says is that we may need to remove them from the church if they do not repent. He says, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of flesh so that the spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. And then later he says, don't even eat with such a person. Now, this is pretty harsh language. I, I don't... I, I love Paul because he's so frank, quite frankly. Um, but the language feels a little harsh to us, especially in our day and age. So what he's saying here is that we need to remove the illusion that this person has that they're a believer. What we need to help them understand is, is that if they are going to be flamboyant and defiant about things and not submit to what God's word says, then have they really submitted to Christ's grace? And we have to ask them to think about that and to wrestle with that. And, and that's, that is what he's talking about. It, really what he's saying is there's two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of the sun and there's the kingdom of darkness, which is ruled by Satan. And what he's saying is, listen, we love you, we care about you, but the way that you're engaging in all of this makes us think that you are more in the kingdom of darkness than in the kingdom of the sun. Now, we pray that you will put your hope and trust in Jesus, but we don't want you to put this under this illusion that, that just because you're, you, 
you, you went to church or you did something that, that you think that you're saved. You, you have to wrestle with this on a deeper level. And that's what he's trying to say. He's trying to say here is that you need to call a spade a spade and say, ah, as much as we would love you and we care about you, and it's exactly why we say these things, we need to ask you to evaluate your life and see where you stand with God. Because right now we're seeing a defiant and unrepentant attitude. And, and that's not the marks of a true believer. Now scholars debate what this meal he's talking about here. For some, it means a fellowship meal, a meal where it says like we were one. I think he's actually talking about the Lord's Supper. And I, the reason why is that it's going to come in. I don't know when we'll look at it. Maybe next year. 1 Corinthians 11. Um, where he talks about it. And that would make sense. And that would actually be what church discipline would look like. It is a last step. We don't want to go there. Where does it start? It starts with all of us. If we see somebody who's wrestling with something, we want to call a spade a spade. Not because we're self-righteous or we think we're better than them, but because we care about them and we want to see them grow. If that doesn't work, we go to two. If that doesn't work, we go to the church. The church goes and they do everything they can over a long period of time in a gracious manner and in, a, in a hopefully not a harsh or self-righteous way, but in a loving way to this person repeatedly to say, hey, we love you, but we're seeing this and we want you to deal with this thing. And then ultimately, if it comes to a spot where they still remain unrepentant and defiant, the church may say, hey, what we need to do is we need to show you that, that your attitude and your actions right now, we're going to keep you from the Lord's table because the Lord's table is something that believers do. And so we're going to ask that you don't participate in communion. But I want you to see that Paul, even in having this conversation, wants to clarify that he wants them to have an ongoing relationship with those outside of the church. He said, in my last letter, I told you to do this. Maybe what you think is like you as Christians need to huddle and not engage with people of this world, including the people that I'm going to treat, have you treat as an outsider. No, no, no. I don't want you to be removed from the world. I want you to stay in the midst of it. And I want you to be gracious to those who aren't living up to these standards because we want them to hear the gospel message before you nitpick all the behaviors. And including this person, if you have to remove them from the Lord's table, I want you to keep that ongoing relationship with them. Not a fun message to preach. But it's an important one, and I think it's actually important for us to have the conversation now when we're not in the midst of things like this. So if something like this arises, and if we have to come to this situation, then we have a biblical way and justification for dealing with this. But I want you to see it's not just about the big bad elders or pastors pointing their finger at everybody else. It's a church-wide process for all of us. And it starts small and gets bigger. It's only if somebody is defiant and unrepentant that it gets to this level. We are not dealing with sins that we all wrestle with, that we know are wrong, we admit the wrong, and we're doing what we can to overcome them. That's called sanctification. But I think Paul addresses an important question, and that is this. Why is church discipline important? Like, why do we do this? And I think what we need to hear is his heart. His heart is to win the heart of the sinning believer. Maybe that was not the best phrase because they just said he was kicked out. But the goal is to win that person who's being defiant and unrepentant. And as I said over, handing them over to Satan removes the pretense of faith. The goal is that they see themselves clearly and they understand that they need the gospel and they need Jesus. And, and they do that. And so they're taking all of these steps not to just self-righteously condemn and make themselves feel better but rather for this person to, to hopefully help them see in the mirror and say, this is something you're wrestling with and you, you need to take it seriously. But the goal is to win the heart of that person and that they can see that they, maybe this illusion that they had about their state is incorrect. So they put their hope and trust in Jesus and maybe they are saved and maybe God's worked, but they, they just see the undefiance, the defiance in themselves. And, and even in the process of all this, ultimately, hopefully they submit to what the Bible teaches, and, and they, they go through the process of, of grace and learning and growing and all this thing. But it also keeps other believers from being led astray. Paul uses all this language of yeast, 
And, and he uses this language of like getting rid of the old yeast and then having the new leavened bread. And there's all kinds of different ways that we could view this, but ultimately, I mean, I could go into all kinds of Old Testament ways that he weaved it all in. And, but here's what I think we need to get. What Paul is saying is that we rub shoulders with each other and we have an influence on each other. And when we just kind of un- let certain sins go unchecked, those things can rub against each other and, and we can rub on them. My guess is the church situation that we talked about in, the, in the, the prayer didn't just happen overnight, right? There's a culture and an attitude that's allowed to foster. And, and the more that we allow it to, the, the, it's like yeast. It allows it to, to gain more and more traction and get bigger and bigger and bigger. And what Paul says is we got to keep that sinful heart attitudes that we all have and we all wrestle with from overcoming the church. And instead, he says, what you need to be let rise up and percolate is what Christ has done, that his grace is, is bigger than our sins. And, that, and remember his, sacrificial, his sacrifice that he made. And the Passover lamb is, and the, the Passover festival was all about a remembering that God saved the Israelites from huge amounts of destruction. And what he's saying is, if you're going to let something levitate and grow in your church, let that appreciation of God's grace and his righteousness, I think is what he means by sincerity and truth, rise up in your body of believers and let it rise up your body, let it grow it, rather than the yeast of the old sinful nature that we constantly wrestle with. And so when we point out sins, and if we get to the spot, the goal is that we help all of us deal with the sins, and we recognize that it's a sin, and we don't get sucked into it, because this is what everybody else in the church is doing. But there's another reason, and that is for the sake of our witness to the world. I mean, Paul says, therefore, let us keep this festival with sincerity and truth, and then he says, go hang out with these people who are outside the world, who are going to act very different than you. And the way that we engage with them should be based on what? Graciousness and truth. So they should see that there's difference in our lives, that we act different than the culture around us, that we beat to a different drum. And that drum is Jesus. And we walk in this tension of being aware of our sinfulness and that we're works in progress and that Christ's grace is greater than it, but not being okay with it. And being on this road of constantly wanting to try and grow because of it. And and he says that when people see this tension, when he sees grace and love, truth, and and unconditional kindness and, and love, they'll notice. And so he says, for the sake of our world, we need to be different. We need them to see that we do things differently because of what Jesus has done. And so one of the reasons why we do church discipline is because... We want the world to see that our actions and our attitudes are different. Paul cares about this person and he cares about the church. And so he urges them to deal with the sin that they are wrestling with. But even in this text right here, he reminds them that God's grace is greater. And hopefully any discipline that happens, even though it may be having to draw a line, says, Our hope is that you recognize this thing as a sin so that you can come and put your hope in a savior. That's the goal of everything. And so he even highlights that again in his text. So a heavy text, but I think it's an important text for us to wrestle with. How do we engage with one another and how do we ultimately deal with people who are defiant and unrepentant? I want you to show, I can't think of a better way to end (laughs) my sermon than taking communion. Because what does communion remind us of? That we're sinners and we need to recognize that. What does communion remind us of? That we need to submit ultimately to God's grace and his love for us. There's a humiliation that happens. I don't like to walk around and act like 
Uh, I'm ungodly and unrighteous to you all. I, the way that we want to act is like we have our act together. And even the act of communion reminds us as we step forward and we take it. That's not the case. We are still works in progress. But we want to grow in our righteousness. Because out of gratitude of what Christ has done. And so when we take communion here at the end of the service, it reminds us of our brokenness, that we're constantly going to battle sin, but it also reminds us of the lordship of Jesus, that he's the ultimate Lord of our life because of the gift that he's given us. And we hold those two things in tension. We submit, we bow, we admit our brokenness, and we look to him as the guide of our life and also as the savior of our life. And for those of us who are wrestling with constant sin, and it may feel like, man, is Brad, Brad talking about me? I hope that it's an opportunity for you to see. We're talking about defiant and unrepentant sin. And even the fact that you, you say, I'm still wrestling with this and it's still hard, shows to me that you are repentant and grace is at work in your life. And may you feel that as we take communion here today. Christ's grace and his love should dictate everything, including when we have to get to this ultimate step of church discipline. And let's remember his grace and his love when we take communion. Let's pray. You have just watched a sermon from Crossway Church in Battleground, Washington. We hope that you enjoyed it, and we'd love to have you come join us for a worship service on Sunday at 10 a.m. at 311 North Parkway Avenue in Battleground, Washington. If you'd like to find more information about us online, you can find it at crosswaychurchwa.com.